Good evening. Thanks for joining for our midweek Bible study. We appreciate your presence very much. Whenever you're watching this, wherever you're watching it from, thanks for taking time to join with us as we take a journey through the Old Testament. That's what we've been doing for years as we study on Wednesdays. Uh, we've just been dealing with the Old Testament. We started in Genesis years ago, and we've worked our way up, not quite to the middle of the Psalms, but we're getting close to the middle. Uh, we're going to be in the 57th Psalm here this morning or this evening whenever you're watching this. Thanks for joining with us. You're always invited to come and be a part of what we're doing in person. We tape this uh, midweek Bible study. We tape it every Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock, and we do that in the worship center where the cameras are so that we can tape it. And then I do the same Bible study every Wednesday evening at 6.30. We'd love to have you here uh, with us in person if you can at either of those times. I saw someone this morning that's usually here in the evening for our Wednesday night Bible study, but uh, they were having company this week, so he said he just decided to come this morning. So either time is, is fine. It's the same Bible study. We'd love to have you either time. And of course, on Sundays, we'd love to see you and have you be a part of what God is doing here at First Baptist Hendersonville. God has been blessing us in an incredible way, and I thank Him for His goodness and His favor shining upon us. Every Sunday morning, we have worship at three hours, and there are connect group classes, Bible study classes, or if you are old school and still want to call them Sunday school classes, that is all the same thing, and those meet every hour as well. 8.30, 9.45, and 11 o'clock, we have worship that uh, is offered by a choir and orchestra. If you like that style of worship, we also have worship that's led by a praise band, more of a contemporary style, though many of the songs are the same, and we'd love to have you come and be a part of any of those services. Well, we're going to study Psalm 57 this morning. If you've got a Bible, I hope you'll open it. It's always good to have God's Word open in front of you. And before we jump into this, let me ask God's blessing. We shared several prayer requests this morning, and let me pray right now. Father, thank you for the day. It's a beautiful day. We thank you for it. Uh, there are needs all around us. There are needs in this room. I, I visited with some people here just a moment ago that are awaiting some test results, and, and uh, that's an anxious season of life to just be waiting. And um, sometimes uh, our, our mind uh, begins to work on us, and we become anxious. And I pray for your grace to be sufficient and for your presence to be felt and for a peace that passes all understanding to guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, we've shared several prayer requests, people in the hospital, people that have lost loved ones. There are many unspoken requests every time we gather together. And Lord, we just seek to do what the Bible tells us to do, and that is to cast our cares upon you, to intercede for one another, to uh, bring our own personal petitions and intercessions before you. And, Lord, we do that right now. We ask your blessings and for your will to be accomplished. We pray for our nation. We pray for our community. We pray for the world uh, situation, the turmoil that goes on around the world. Uh, we pray for those that are still hurting from uh, disasters, weather disasters, various things that have happened around the world. We pray for those that are in specific moments of distress and need. And, Lord, we just acknowledge that you are a great, loving God and that this, all of the problems that we deal with in this world are the result of being in a fallen world that has stepped away from your plan and your, your, your grace. And we live looking forward to the day when we, will, when we will be in a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no pain, no sorrow, no disease, no heartache because there will be no sin. And we thank you that you have ordained that at one, in one day, at one day, at one time, that only you know that you will sound the trumpet and all things will be made new. And we live looking forward to that great day. Thank you for the privilege of opening your word again. And I pray that, that for every person that there will be at least one thought that would encourage them today. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Psalm 57 is another one of these psalms that is written from inside of a cave. And this is another one of those psalms that is a song. So uh, I wonder what the acoustics were like in these caves when David and whoever was singing with him were singing these psalms to the Lord that he wrote. Uh, have any of you ever been over to um, 
uh, I think it's called Music in a Cavern or something like that. It's over, I think the community is Pelham, Tennessee. It's north of Mont Eagle. I haven't been there, but I've heard people talk about it. They have concerts in this big open uh, cavern underground, and I've heard people say that it's really, really an interesting place to go, both for the acoustics, but the lighting itself, the way that they have it uh, fixed for the for the uh, music, is also very interesting. It might have been something like that in these caves where this uh, took place. You notice the heading there says, Praise for God's Protection. Now, that's not a part of Scripture. That's just to help us kind of have a capsule of what this is about. But it, it, notice it's not a prayer for God's protection. It's a praise for God's protection. So he's not asking God to protect him. He's thanking God that he did protect him. He is acknowledging what God has done, and, and we need to do that as well. We need, we all, we're need we pretty good about praying for help. God, help me. I'm in trouble. God, help my family. They're in trouble. We need to remember to go back and praise the Lord and thank the Lord for those seasons that we go through in life and he's with us and when we get through it we go on our merry way and uh, you know like like the uh, the men who were healed and uh, most of them did not come back to thank Jesus for what he did for them we need to be sure that we come back and say thank you so that's what this is it is a thank you it says for the choir director so it's a song do not destroy now is that just a word uh, don't don't mess this song up. Don't lose it. Keep it in a safe place. No, it, you notice it's in quotation marks. And if you look back at the at the the chapter last week, the one that Jerry taught last week, it said for the choir director, according to a silent dove far away. Now that is a uh, a a title of a song or a tune, more likely a tune that they knew. And so these words would have been sung to that tune. Now, this is a tune name, Do Not Destroy. I don't know what it sounded like. I don't know what the rhythm of it was, but they knew. And they could sing these words to that tune. And interestingly, if you look at the next psalm, the one we'll study next week, it says for the choir director, you see it? Do Not Destroy. It's the same tune name. So both of these psalms could be sung to the same tune. And if you notice, they're both about the same length. You see that? If, if you're a poet or a musician, you could see how these two psalms could be similar in the, in the rhythm of it and the length of it so that they could fit the same tune. So that, that's what that's all about. And then it says, when he fled before Saul into the cave. Now, Saul often chased David into caves. David spent a lot of time hiding from Saul in various places, and when caves were available, those were good hiding places. Now, had there only been a cave or two available, Saul would have found him fairly quickly, but caves are everywhere in that part of the world. Uh, there are a lot of caves down toward En Gedi. You've heard the you know of En Gedi from Scripture. <clears throat> it's an oasis. Uh, en Gedi is to the southeast of Jerusalem. It's right down at the edge of the Dead Sea. It's on the border of Jordan. And, and uh, many of the times that David wrote Psalms, he was in those caves around En Gedi. But this one seems likely that he's not in that region at this point, but he's on the other side of Israel to the southwest of Jerusalem in a place that's called Adullam, Adullam. Now, uh, in Israel today, there is a national park that's called the Adullam Cave Park. And there are a series of caves there, just like you might take a day trip and go up to uh, Mammoth Caves, or there are other caves around that part of Kentucky, right? It's not the only one. There are a lot of caves, but that just happens to be the biggest one, and that's, that's probably the one that everybody thinks of the most when you think about a cave in southern Kentucky. Well, it, there's, there's uh, Mammoth Cave, and if you go out to, uh, where is it, New Mexico, you've got Carlsbad uh, Caverns. So you've got caves that, uh, many caves, but some caves that are really well-known. This is probably one that was just really well-known. Now, you might want to write down in the margin right there at the heading, write down 1 Samuel 22, 1 Samuel 22, and hold your place there, and let's just go back to 1 Samuel 22 and, uh, and, and see what this says, 1 Samuel 22. This is probably the incident 
out of which David writes this particular psalm. Uh, this is a, an occasion, Psalm 22. David, again, is running from Saul. It's this paranoia that Saul has and this love-hate relationship. And this is what it says. So David left Gath and took refuge. Now, one of the reasons that I think he's probably talking about this incident is because of that word refuge. It's a specific word, and it's used here to describe this cave. And when we get back over to Psalm 57 and we start reading that, you're going to see he uses that same word. I think it ties these two passages together. So David left Gath and took refuge in the cave of Adullam. Now, Adullam is first mentioned back in Genesis 38. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a historic place. And everybody in that region would have known of Adullam. And there are many caves in that region. But notice it says the cave. You see that? That uh, article is in the original text. So it's not just a cave. It's not one of many caves. It is the cave. So apparently, people would have known which cave he was talking about. There was one primary cave probably there. Let's finish reading this uh, story a little bit just so you have a background of what's going on. When David's brothers and his father's whole family heard, they went down and joined him there. In addition, every man who was desperate, in debt, or discontented rallied around him. That really doesn't sound like a great group of people to have around you, does it? They were desperate, in debt, or discontented, but that's who it was. And he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. From there, David went to Mizpah of Moab, where he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and mother stay with you until I know what God will do for me. So he left them in the care of the king of Moab, and they stayed with him the whole time David was in the stronghold. That's the cave. Then the prophet Gad said to David, Don't stay in the stronghold. Leave and return to the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Hereth. Now, that's probably the incident uh, out of which David writes this particular psalm in Psalm 57. So let's go back to it, and uh, we'll just read down through it, and I'll talk about it as we go. Uh, by the way, I did not mention there in the little heading, it says a Davidic psalm. David wrote it, and then it, it's got a strange word, miktam, miktam, M-I-K-T-A-M. That word miktam means, literally it means sad um, or mournful. But it's probably describing a season of melancholy, and we all go through that. You know, there are times that you just kind of, maybe you start thinking about when your kids were little, and you start missing that season of life, and you get a little melancholy, so you go pull out a scrapbook, and you look at some pictures, and that's, you know, if you've lost a loved one, that's, that's both a a good therapeutic thing to do and it makes you feel good on one hand but on the other hand it kind of makes you sad at the same time so there's that melancholy spirit and that's probably what this is talking about David is thankful for what the Lord did the Lord protected him but at the same time in his mind while he's looking at this photo album of what God protected him through it makes him a little sad because he had to spend all of those years running from Saul and he wasn't trying to hurt Saul he had no uh, he, he had no desire to take Saul's position away from him. He would have never lifted a finger to hurt God's anointed one. And so he lost a season of his life because he was having to run from Saul during this time. So it was that, that kind of melancholy. Let, let's read it. Verse 1. Be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me. Now, any time, this is, this is just a biblical truism. Anytime you're reading Scripture and a word or a phrase is immediately repeated, that, that, that is an exclamation point doubled. It is a neon sign saying, pay attention to this. This is significant. There is an emphasis that he's placing here by repeating it again. And what he's really saying, he's speaking an urgency. This is an urgent thing. Be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me. For I take, and I pointed this word out when I was reading 1 Samuel 22, right? I, I, I made the point that this is why I'm connecting that cave to this incident. I take refuge 
in you. He, he says, he uses that word again in the next phrase, I will seek refuge. Same word that was used to describe that season in the cave of, of Agilom. Now, he says, I take refuge in you. And I've written out beside that in my scripture, I've written the word alone. I take refuge in you alone. When David was in that cave, there was nothing he could do. He couldn't fix his situation. He couldn't make Saul stop chasing him. He couldn't build a defense. He couldn't come up with some strategy that would make this different. He was holed up in a cave, and the only thing he could do was to trust in God. Have you been in any of those caves in your life? Sure you have. There's not much you can do. You can't fix the problem. You can't fix the grandkids. You can't fix the kids. You can't fix the relationship. You can't fix the situation. There's just not a whole lot you can do. But we take refuge in the Lord. We call on Him. We cast our care on Him. We seek Him. We pray to Him. We, we fall at His feet because... Our refuge is in Him alone. He's the only one who can help. I take refuge in you alone, only you. I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until danger passes. Now, you might want to just kind of put a little underline in the word until. That's a word of assurance. He doesn't say, I'll put my trust in you and hope that danger passes and or, or I'll put my trust in you and I'll follow you if danger passes. That word until doesn't have the word if in it. It's not an iffy word. He's saying, I know that you're going to respond. I know that you're here. I know that you're going to help me. And I, I, will, I will hide under the shadow of your wings until, until you allow this danger to pass you know that picture of hiding under the wings is a common one in scripture it's the picture of a of a bird that's protecting uh, her young ones under her wings jesus used that same picture uh, when he was looking out over the city of jerusalem as he was walking into the city and he stopped and he prayed over jerusalem uh, he he used that same analogy um, there are other places that Scripture uses an analogy of a child being protected by a parent. It, there are all kinds of pictures for that, but you get the idea. Uh, uh, David, who is going to be the king of Israel, is dependent on the Lord. The only help he's going to get is going to come from the Lord. And he says, I will trust in you until. I love that word, until. Verse 2. I call to God most high. Now, the most high has that bullet point beside it. We've looked that up many times. You know by now that that means he's talking about the supreme ruler of the universe. He is talking about Jehovah God, not a God. He's talking about the God. I call to the God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. You don't ever need to forget that God has a purpose for you. And I don't care if you're 10 years old or 50 years old or 90 years old. If you are alive and have breath, God has a purpose for you. And until the day that you breathe your last breath and you leave this world and walk into the next world, God has a purpose for you. And I love the way Jeremiah worded that. You know this passage, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans you have, I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your welfare, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. God has a plan and a purpose for every one of you. And I've talked to many people. I've talked to many people who have said to me, I don't know why God leaves me here. I don't know why I'm still here. I'm ready to go. I, 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 I pray that the Lord would take me. But the reality is God has a purpose for them. It, that purpose may be to, to, to be a prayer warrior for somebody in the family. And if you can't do anything else, you can pray. I've got to be honest and tell you that I left my mom many times, many times. My mom who didn't know who I was didn't know anything around her, who suffered in that condition for years. 
And I'd sit in the parking lot and pray to God and say, God, why have you left her here another day? God, please take her today. There's no better day than today for her to see heaven. And, and, and another day would pass, and another month would pass, and another year would pass. And that went on from 2013 until last year, 2021. God, why are you making her just be in that bed in that horrible condition? And I had to come to a point personally to say that God has a purpose for that too. And, you know, one of the purposes might be that that just kept me going to that facility week after week. Every few days I was there, I got to know health care workers. I got to know nurses. I got to know people that were in and out of her room. I got to build relationships with people and interject into people's lives and they got to know me for who I am and we had a whole lot of conversations I wasn't able to have a conversation with mom I had a conversation with other people her roommate she just went to be with the Lord last year I I had many many conversations with her roommate who was able to communicate I just have to believe that God had a purpose for all of that and that's what he says God you have a plan you have a purpose and I will call on God Most High who will fulfill His purpose for me. Verse 3, He reaches down from heaven and saves me. That is a beautiful image, isn't it? It's a, it, imagine a picture in your mind of a child in some water. Maybe they're in the lake. Maybe they're in a pool. And they get into some trouble and a parent just reaches down and grabs hold of them and just lifts them up. Just... <laughs> that's, what, that, that, that's the image of what God does. He has reached down from heaven. And he has saved me. Now, he's, there's a spiritual element to that. Through Jesus, he has spiritually saved us. But D David's talking about physical, literal. He saved me from destruction. He has reached down from heaven and saved me, challenging the one who tramples me. And then there's that word Selah. Think about that. Let that marinate in your heart for a moment. Then he makes this statement, God sends his faithful love and truth. He's going to use that same phrase on down in verse 10. If you'll let your eyes just scan down through it, he says, For your faithful love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches the clouds. David loved that concept of the faithfulness of God. He is faithful. There's a lot of music that talks about the faithfulness of God. I... You know, there's several hymns that I think of. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy who through life has been my guide? The faithfulness of God. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been. What's that next line? Thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. That's what David is. He's going back to the faithfulness of God. God sends his faithful love. Verse 4, I am in the midst of lions. Now, they, you go to Israel today, you don't see lions and you don't see bears, and yet the Old Testament is full of lions and bears. So they had, in those days, they had um, those kinds of animals. Um and David uses that as a picture of his enemies. He says, I'm in the midst of lions. And he's talking about those. He's not literally talking about lions in that moment. He's not afraid because he's hearing the growl of an animal outside. He's using the picture of lions as an image of the enemies that are trying to kill him. Saul and his uh, men. I am in the midst of lions. I lie down with those who devour men. Their teeth are spears and arrows their tongues are sharp swords God be exalted above the heavens that sounds like a hymn doesn't it God be exalted above the heavens let your glory be above the whole earth they prepare a net for my steps and he, there is an image of a hunter who is uh, using a net as a snare for an animal or even a fisherman that's using a net for catching fish. They prepare a net for my steps. I was downcast. They dug a pit ahead of me, but they fell into it. You know, the Bible uses that picture a lot of, of, of the enemy trying to harm us, and they harm themselves in the process. 
Psalm 7, Psalm 34, Psalm 35, Psalm 37. We've already studied a lot of Psalms that have that same idea. They're trying to trap us, but they trap themselves. And then he has that word again, Selah. Think about that for a minute. Now, verse 7 through 11 is a very intense passage. Now, I'm let me read this. I'm going to read the whole thing and then talk about it for just a minute. Follow with me. My heart is confident, God. I will sing. I will sing praises with the whole of my being. Wake up, harp and lyre. I will wake up the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your faithful love, there's that word again, for your faithful love is higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches the clouds. God, be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over the whole earth. Now, did anybody read exactly like what I just said? Anybody? Was this exactly like what I just read? It was a little different, wasn't it? You know why? I wasn't reading Psalm 57. I was reading Psalm 108. So if you'll write down beside that passage in Psalm 57, write down Psalm 108, verses 1 through 5. Now, it was similar enough, wasn't it, that you could follow it? It was similar enough that it sounded the same. It just sounded like a little change here and a little change there. Apparently, David liked this song so well that he decided to use this verse of it. You know, songs have verses and choruses and verses and choruses, and he decided to use this section of that song again. And when he got to Psalm 108, he almost quoted it verbatim, but it changed up just a little bit. So uh, you, you find this, th this same thing in two different psalms. So let, let me go back now. Now I am reading from Psalm 57. Uh, let's see what it says, verse 7. My heart is confident. God, my heart is confident. What did I tell you about when something is repeated? You, you put a focus on it. it, it it's, there's an exclamation, park that part, uh, exclamation mark there at that point. He is wanting to emphasize the fact that he is trusting in God. My heart is confident, God. I will sing. I will sing praises. Verse 8, wake up, my soul. Wake up, harp and lyre. That phrase, wake up my soul, is common in songs. Um, wake up my soul and sing of him who died for me. Remember that hymn? There's a new modern hymn uh, written by Chris Tomlin. With that same, It comes from the same passage, Awake My Soul. It's a beautiful passage that calls us to realize that's what it's doing awake my soul wake up soul realize that God's at work don't get down in the doldrums don't get to feeling sorry for yourself don't start feeling like you know uh, uh, all is bad and the world is falling apart awake my soul and realize that God is going to help me through this and I love that little phrase there at the end of verse 8 where it says I will wake up the dawn now, normally, the dawn wakes us up. How many times do you wake up because the sun comes up? The sun wakes you up. He says, I will wake up the dawn. I'm going to sing praises through the night, and when the dawn comes, I'm going to wake the dawn up and still be singing praises to the Lord. It's just a picture of how full his heart is in thanking the Lord for what he's done. I will praise you, Lord, verse 9. I will praise you, Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your faithful love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. God, be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over the whole earth. Somebody in a room this size with this many people is in a cave right now. Somebody is in some circumstances in your life where the enemy is roaring around you. And the enemy would like nothing better than to scare you so soundly, so profoundly that you would become a victim of fear over the what if of your life. What if? What if? Our God is faithful. 
And no matter what comes our way, God is going to walk with you even through the valley of the shadow of death. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And no matter what comes your way, God is faithful to be with you. And that ought to put a smile on your face and a song in your heart because God is faithful. And David used this psalm to just say once again, thank you, Lord. It's not a prayer for God to protect him. It is a word of thanks that God did protect him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the many, many times that we've been in caves, circumstances around us were frightening. And it was easy to let our minds go in directions to wonder what if this happens and that happens. And sometimes bad things happen. There's a death or there's a change of life. Things happen. But what we've learned is that even through it, you're with us and you have a plan and you will walk with us every day until the day comes when you will reach down and lift us up and even through death will allow us to walk in your presence so Lord help us to live today as faithful people help us to live today as trusting people help us to live today as followers of Jesus who fully believe that no matter what happens in this world God is in control and that one day we're going to stand in his presence. And for that, we will give you thanks forever. In Jesus' name, amen.